everyone. Welcome to MetalNet. I am Sarah, and I am excited because I have another amazing guest for you. Today, I have Phil Susan. You all know who he is because he has played in like every band all of us have ever listened to. He is best known for Ozzy Osbourne Band, but he's also played with Billy Idol. He's in Last in Line. He has some amazing solo stuff he's doing, and I want you all to help me welcome him. Hello, Phil. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, thank Would you for you coming like on. Thank you for coming on. You have to know that when I first got into Ozzy, my first album was Ultimate Sin. So for me, and I think this is true of everybody, for me, when I think of a band and like the original lineup, for me, it's like who I, who I knew when I came into a band. So for me, it's you and Jakey e. Lee and Randy Castillo and everything. So I'm really excited to have you on and talk to you about your whole career and learn a little bit, a little bit more about your, your Ozzy days as well. Yeah, well, uh, they were fantastic times and um, they don't seem that long ago, but, you know, each year goes past, it's another year and, uh, and, and it was a while ago, but I'm glad that uh, it stood the test of time and I get a lot of communications from people, even from younger people who are just starting to discover um, uh, that album. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't listen to it for a long time and you know, maybe a decade or a decade and a half or something. And then I sat down and I started listening to it. And I thought, this is a really good record, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it's it's very nice. It's very flattering. And it's it's I'm, I'm just honored to be um, part, to have been part of that era. So it's uh, that's something I don't take um, for granted. And I don't take very lightly either. Very grateful for it. So. Well, well, we'll get into that. We'll kind of go in chronological order a little bit. So we'll talk a little bit about it when we get to it in line. But um, I want to start with talking to you about where you started in music. So I find that when I talk to people, there's sort of two times in their life that they tend to start. One is around the 12 year old mark. And then sometimes you get people who started really, really young. And you're one of those ones that started really, really young. I read that you were as little as three years old when you got your first instrument. Is that true? And what instrument was it? Yeah, um... My mom had a couple of cousins who lived in France and they were, their father was a professional musician. He taught their children. He taught his children a ton of instruments. They, they played just about everything between the two of them. And when they would come over and visit in Eng when I was a kid in England, uh, they, uh, they brought me a little guitar one time, a real guitar, but a, re a miniature guitar, you know? And uh, I just had it around all the time. I was also very much in, into music. Uh, someone had bought me a little record player when I was probably two, and I would sit down with a stack of records, and I'm, so I'm told, and I would put the records on, and I would sing along to them, and then I'd take the record off, put the next record on, I learned how to do this. So music was something that was very, um, it was very close to me all the time. And having an instrument around uh, was, um, you know, satisfied what curiosity I had for music because I could play, I could pick it up and I could play with it and I might not be able to play the instrument, but familiarity is a great uh, part of that. So having an instrument there was, was magical. Uh, years later, I started to learn other instruments and I went through the usual sort of, you know, uh, uh, childhood instruments that the kids go through and as soon as- I, they, Violin was one of them? Violin. Well, that was a little bit later. I mean, in primary school, you know, the first most accessible forms of music were singing in a choir, of course, mm -hmm. and then recorders. And in England, every, there, were, there were these recorder ensembles that would take place all the time. And that was considered to be a, a good first instrument. So I played recorders, melodicas, and uh, all of these things. And gradually, by the time I got to secondary school, which in England is about at age 11, Mm -hmm. that's when um, I, started, I picked up the violin and started getting violin lessons. Did you choose the violin or was that sort of something that was assigned to you in school? No, 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 I, cho I chose it. Um, I, I don't honestly remember why I thought it was, uh, it was something that seemed to be, uh, make sense to me. I mean, look, there's a ton of instruments in an orchestra and, mm -hmm. you know, there's always the, the one kid that, you know, you'd see at the train station carrying this huge tuba, you know, and I, I think to myself, why, what would possess somebody to say, you know what I want to do? I want to learn to play the tuba. <laughs> I'm going to have to cart this big, you know, thing that looks like a, a you know, a, a brass toilet seat around for the next uh, X number of years. Sorry, that's my dog in the background. She's barking at something. Um, so, you know, people are drawn to certain instruments. I, 
I don't know, you know, some of my very good friends were, one of my good friends was an oboe player, which is, uh, he played oboe and, and cor anglais or French horn, uh, English horn, however you want to say it. Um, you know, we played different instruments. The violins said something to me. I don't know. Yeah. Do you still play violin ever? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember how I it all, it or has it been a while? Yeah, I, I actually dug it out of storage and I brought it home and I took it out and I played it and I thought, oh, that's awful. And I put it back into the box. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to pick it up again sometime. And I would, I have all my books here. I mean, I would probably just have to go from, you know, very quickly do a crash course from point A to point B. Right. I guess it would be possible, right? I, I think we still have a little bit of time before uh, before real life resumes. So maybe maybe now's your chance. Yeah. To, uh, <laughs> to pick a violin again. So at some point you just uh, you decided to become a bass player. Um, yeah. And I actually had read that you were in a band that had I think this is kind of typical. Like you were in a band with like four guitar players. Um, so how old were you at that point? And then what made you decide to be the one to switch to bass? Um, it was it was a sort of double combination thing um, you're correct at, at right when musically inclined people of my age at school or the, within my group of friends were starting to get into playing instruments most of them were guitar players mm -hmm. and so there was no bass players so I'd say hey uh, you, uh, you're looking for a, a guitar player I'd say no no can you play the bass no no I, I play guitar and uh, somebody else would say, we're trying to put a band together. Oh, do you need a guitar player? No, we've got a guitar player. We need a bass player. Oh, okay. Finally, somebody said to me, do you play the bass? And I said, yes, I play the bass. Oh, great. Okay, well, come on then. So there was part, part of it was that. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it, uh, I think, was um, that I was starting to get really drawn to that through classical studies as well. So um, when I was doing my classical music, um, lessons and stuff, you know, we did a lot of uh, four part harmony, we did a lot of Bach, that kind of stuff. And I was starting to get drawn to the basic, the bass, not the bass guitar, obviously, but the bass instrument mm -hmm. um, and learning in, and learning the relationship between the bass instrument and between the melody lines. And that, that is of paramount importance in, the, in, in that style of classical music, which is uh, referred to as figured bass. And so these were the two important things with the melody and the bass line. And I was starting to get very much drawn to that. Uh, there was a discovery period where I found that uh, the violin, which was of course tuned to G, D, A, and E, and the bass, which was tuned E, A, D, G, is the exact inverse. They're, they're opposite. So there's a relationship between the bass and between the violin, which meant I sort of, if I thought backwards, I could actually, I knew where all the notes were. So it was very easy to adapt to it. This is probably a little bit more technical than most people would want to <laughs> want to know, but anyone musical would understand what I'm saying. The violin's tuned in fifths, bass is tuned in fourths. So if you think backwards, it's all there. You've done all the work. So all of these things kind of converged um, into me going down to uh, Blank's music store in Kilburn. I think it was 19, I want to say 70, three or 74 and I bought a bass guitar nice. 20 24 pounds including strings and a strap <laughs> how long did it take you to become comfortable where you, you felt like you could call yourself a bass player uh hmm. I, I don't know I don't I never really referred to myself as a bass player I I I, I relate to the comfortable part of it mm -hmm. at the beginning I was really trying to play everything that I heard on, mm -hmm. on the bass um, and then certain other things as well. I mean, I did some kind of crazy things. I would play along to like Brandon Burke and Chicago's like classical music on the bass because learning those bass parts, were, they were very melodic. I mean, it was really cool. And uh, I had uh, thoroughly recommend it to anybody. I mean, it's a, uh, um, and, and when I started feeling comfortable with it, I mean, I literally did, went everywhere with that guitar. I slept with it. I mean, it was, if I went to, babysit my nieces I would take it with uh, I had it all the time carried around all the time and I felt very comfortable with it um, and you know it, 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 it I just wanted to be able to play it uh, uh, without having to think too much right. and I suppose that took 
two or three years, maybe a couple of years. Mm. I mean, perception is everything. You know, if I walked into a room and said, yes, I'm a bass player, everyone went, okay, great, plug in. <laughs> yeah, well, no, and I, you could have just as easily answered, listen, I was a teenager, I decided I was the greatest bass player on earth the second I started playing it. You know what uh, I mean? Because I think no, some I wasn't. I wasn't the greatest. That kid. I was in awe of, of so many musicians and uh, I, I still don't think, you know, I don't think like that. I, 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 I'm still amazed by some people that I hear, you know, it's, uh, it's, everyone has a, a, a unique and uh, an individual gift, you know, in playing their instrument and a, a style mm -hmm. beyond just playing the notes, it's something that makes it all, you know, makes it just feel just great. You know, you just get this feeling like, wow, that person really has a very cool angle on, on this. You know, um, it's funny you say that um, Vivian Campbell, I saw an interview of his where he talked about your bass playing being very intricate and musical, that you have a way of looking for the spaces and filling them musically without overplaying. Do you, is that sort of your approach to bass playing or do you see your style as being a little different than that? Well, um, I, I, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment from Viv. Thank you, Viv. <laughs> um, I do see it that way. I, I, I see the role of the bass as having a, um, as relating to the melody line, as relating to the vocal line, it's very important. And as such, it has to complement what's going on and it cannot overshadow what's going on, you know, uh, around it either. So some of the bass players I, that I listened to when I was very young, you know, one in particular was Andy Fraser. Mm -hmm. And Andy was brilliant. I mean, he was just a, he is such a minimalistic player. Sometimes he wouldn't play for an entire verse. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, if you listen to All Right Now, which is the free song, which he, I think, wrote, um, you know, the whole verses, he doesn't even play in the verses. Mm -hmm. And when he does play in the choruses, it makes the whole song work. Mm -hmm. So sometimes less is more, you know, and, and leaving those spaces and leaving those holes out creates a, a contrast when it's appropriate. So I really appreciate that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's very cool. I mean, it's not, it's great to have this conversation because not many people ask on this kind of level or ask on this kind of detail, but there are some things that uh, you can do um, rather than just fill everything up, you know, over, overplay. So I have a question for you as a bass player. I, I have a, I've always had an affection for bass players because I feel like I'm not like a musician or anything, but like, I, I, I don't know, I always hear the bass line over a lot of other things. And I do wonder as a bass player, do you find that you have to kind of tiptoe around other musicians and kind of feel your way to see whether you can be that player who can be musical and intricate, or if you do have to kind of fall back a little bit and be a little simpler, or do you feel like when I come in, I, you know, I'm a musician, I bring something to the table and this is kind of what you're signing up for when you work with me. Um, no, I, 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 I don't feel that I have to sort of tiptoe around. I, I, I know what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to do is, uh, takes into consideration, um, several different things. Uh, there has to be something that, um, uh, embellishes what's going on with guitars and with ry particularly rhythm guitars. And there is also something that has to connect it to what's going on with the drums. So there's a rhythmic as uh, element to it as well. Um, I have to use my best judgment uh, to do the most efficient thing with the least possible amount of notes um, to, to make that work. And then within the confines of that, I want to find something that relates to the melody line. And in there is where I can sort of insert um, intricacies. This all sounds like a very thought out process and it's not, it's very instinctive. I mean, this is the whole idea of, of spending years and years learning your craft mm -hmm. is that you immediately know when to sit back a little bit and for, uh, at which point it's more important to support and to work with the rhythmic side of the music versus with the melodic side of the music. And then sometimes you do both and they cross over and, and, and that's, uh, that really comes together nicely but very often when we're working you know I'll, I'll be working with a band and especially in the studio we'll play something and then you know maybe Vinny will turn around to me and say hey you know why don't you make that a little bit more straight over there mm -hmm. you know and that'll give a bit more breathing room to these guitars 
you know, I, I welcome all of those ideas because that's how we create new and unique ideas. That's how we blend all of our styles together to create something that's unique. And, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes say the same thing to somebody else, but I'm very open to it. And, and we want to find, what we want to do is we want to find some way to do justice to the song. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's all about the song. 80% mm -hmm. of people who listen to a song, they're, hear, they're hearing the melody and they're hearing the lyrics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's only the, the smaller 20% that's paying that much attention to what's going on musically. So we must all stay, stay focused on that vocalist. You know, it's like a, it's like a triangle, you know, we're all here in the, back, in, the, in, the back, in the background in the band and we're all focusing on that singer and he's projecting the melody and the, and the lyrics to the audience and that's how it should be. So in listening to you talk, it's clear that you have, you've had a passion for music in your entire life and that you've really dedicated the time and energy to learning it. I was surprised to hear that you actually were, I think, pre-med in college mm -hmm. um, and that you were looking into being a doctor, but it's, I, I'm kind of curious. So if you've spent so much of your young life playing music and really, really dedicating yourself where you're not just messing around, but you're really learning. Um, what was it that made you do pre-med in college? Like, were you still thinking that this, that this might not be your career path or was that just a safety? Were you making parents happy? What was the, what was the pre-med um, plan? I'm, I'm a very, I'm a, one of these people that loves to learn stuff about things. And um, from a, a very young age, I didn't sleep that much at night. I would wake up at probably before in the four o'clock in the morning and then I would start reading things. I was fascinated by sciences, fascinated by electronics, by chemistry. You know, when I was a kid, I had a chemistry set. You probably can't buy a chemistry set anymore because now they would be like, <laughs> hazardous, right? But I had, uh, you know, I would do a lot of chemistry experiments and, and build electronic equipment. Um, and so, and my mom was a, a, a doctor, was a general nurse. And so I was fascinated by that as well. Um, and from a very young age, I was intrigued by, med by medicine, by doctors, by hospitals. And so when I started st uh, studies, I mean, those were my main studies were physics, chemistry, biology. I did math um, and then music. And I loved English literature, which I didn't do very well at. It's ironic considering that <laughs> my, whole, my whole life has been, you know, built around writing lyrics. So, um, but uh, yeah, and then I took, I, I took those up to A level, uh, advanced level degrees in, in uh, physics, chemistry and biology. And so I'm still interested in, I still read about stuff like that. It just got to the point where I had to do one or I had to do the other. And I had to make a decision. It was a difficult decision to make, you know, but I had to s s say to myself, well, I've got a natural gift for, for my studies. I mean, I would literally come home and I had tons of homework. I'd be like, oh, no, no, it's done. Easy, no problem. And so what I would do is I would rush and get that stuff out of the way so that I could pick up the guitar and then play for the next two or three hours. And then when I looked <laughs> objectively at that scenario, I went, well, what's the priority here? The priority is let's get all this nonsense out of the way so I can get to playing the guitar. Yeah, and that was the decision that said, you know, maybe that's what you should do. Mm -hmm. um, the other decision would be great but you might not be happy with it. And so I made that decision. And, you know, I, I say that was the second hardest decision of my, I had to make in my life. Mm -hmm. The first hardest decision I had to make in my life was telling my parents what that second decision had been. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can only begin to imagine uh, what that conversation was like. Um, did you have anything going on musically um, in terms of being in a band that you felt had a chance at that moment? Or was it really just, I just, I have to choose the thing that makes me happy. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, so that moment where you decided you were going to choose music over a field, um, over a career in medicine, were you in any signed bands or about to be signed or? No, no, I was just, I, I mean, I've been playing in, in kid bands and, and young bands for, for, for a few years at this point. And uh, anytime I was at, uh, I was at Cramer College, uh, uh, doing uh, some studies and uh, immediately I'd find there was a girl there who played the piano there was another guy who played guitar and that was it we formed our own that that would happen every single time I'd find the musicians get together with the musicians say let's create some music and so you know the other stuff was was peripheral it seemed that that was always the nucleus was music 
Yeah, you know, you have to be passionate about music. I mean, there are so many jokes. I mean, I tell people, you know, if you want, it, music is not a way to make money. If you want to make money, go do something else. You know, there's tons of jokes about, you know, we talked about doctors who want to be musicians and, you know, uh, the, the musician that wins the lottery and they say, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to keep playing music or money, money runs out. But it's, it's just not, you have to have a passion for it. And passion has to exist beyond everything. And even if you're going to have a very, very difficult life, um, you have to have something that you can turn around and say, I wouldn't change a thing. I love what I do. I love what I do. This means so much to me that this is the only thing that makes any sense. And, I, and I, that's the best advice I can give to people. If you don't feel that way, it might not be the ideal job. You might turn around one day and say, I wish I had done something else. And regret is the worst, the worst sentiment in the world. In fact, you know, I think it's better to regret the things you did do than to regret the things you didn't do. <laughs> but to turn around and say, I wish, I'd done, I, wish I should have done something else is not a, it is, is a sad story to me. Mm. So you have to be really, really sure about what you want to do. I agree with you there. So after you made that decision, you're all in, both feet in, ready to do this. And let's, let's jump to, um, I heard there's a Jimmy Page story that Jimmy Page was uh, part of your musical journey, journey early on. How did you meet him and how, what was your working relationship? Yeah, I was in a band that was uh, uh, Simon Kirk's band after Bad Company, uh, Bank of Wildlife. And we had a deal on, through Simon, uh, we were managed by Peter Grant. Peter was Led Zeppelin's manager. And naturally, we were going to sign with Atlantic, and then Peter said, "No, no, no, we're going to sign with Swan Song." And I was thrilled. I was a huge Led Zeppelin fan, so this was great. <laughs> we did the last album on Swan Song Records, um, and for whatever reason, the band pretty much fizzled out. Uh, Simon went back to Bad Company or whatever, and um, through the connections I'd made at Swan Song, um, I got a call from gentleman by the name of Phil Carlo. Phil was, um, he was one of the Swan Song guys. He was, he tour managed Bad Company and he was Led Zeppelin's tour manager in later days after Richard Cole. And he was looking after Jimmy at the time and he called me up one day and said, you know, Jimmy wants to start playing again. Would you be interested in putting something together with him on a, you know, on that kind of basis? And I said, of course, I'd love to. Mm -hmm. So one day we met together, we, we all met up at a, a rehearsal studio in London. Chris Slade, Jimmy, myself, and we started playing. We played every day for months. And we, it was a fantastic, fantastic time. And during the course of that time, I got, uh, um, I found myself going through an audition process with Ozzy and I got the gig with Ozzy. And now I had a problem, which was that I had to <laughs> decide if I was gonna stay with Jimmy or play with Ozzy. And it was, it sounds like an enviable problem to have, but it, it tore me up. I had no idea what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I mean, these, these were two people. I mean, I, I really wanted to play with Ozzy and I mm -hmm. loved Jimmy and I wanted to play with Jimmy. And I did, just didn't, I, I knew I couldn't do both. Did that audition surprise you? Or I shouldn't say that audition. Did that call that you got from Ozzy's team and, and who made that call to you? Was it Ozzy himself? It, it, it was a, long, a quite a long story. Um, you know, okay. I've seen me playing on a TV show. Uh, I'd known some of his people at his management company. Um, mm -hmm. These things came together. I got a phone call. Somebody handed me the phone and said, it was Ozzy on the other end, said, uh, you know, I want to meet you. But let's meet up at this wine bar or something. And I went to meet him. And then he talked to me and he wanted me to come down and audition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a couple of uh, hurdles that rendered that um, not possible mm -hmm. but then there was a pure chance meeting i was actually staying with my friend phil who i described earlier phil carlo who, who lived in, in brighton and i was staying with him for the weekend his wife and his kids and we were walking in the in brighton and i, I banged into somebody coming out of a store and it was ozzy oh <laughs> what are you doing here what are you doing here and, oh i'm still looking for a bass player why don't you come down i said well because this happened and that happened so well, why don't you come down and play? You go up to London, get a guitar, come back down. And I came down and I played with them for a while and 
a couple of weeks later, I got the audition. I got the gig. That's amazing. Um, so you did have to eventually choose, and you we all know that you chose to play with Ozzy, who you played with for a few years. Um, one of the things that um, happened during that time is that you brought in Shot, Shot in the Dark Mm -hmm. um to the mix and i don't think i realized this but i think shot in the dark was something that you had already written for another project is that correct or was that fresh and new for ultimate sin no it's been it had been written for a long long time before um and i had presented it to to my previous band to wildlife mm -hmm. and there was some stuff they didn't like in it they wanted to make some changes and change the lyrics and change the tempo and what have you and and so we did a a version of it in wildlife which never really got released or anything and then when i left the band it was you know it was my song mm -hmm. it was about four years later or three or four years later that i presented it to in its original form to ozzy mm -hmm. and then ozzy uh, liked it we made a couple of uh, other changes um and went back to and and, and it became the version that everybody knows mm -hmm. so um but yeah it, it had been written a long time before i wrote it on the piano I, I was I was always writing stuff I was always writing tons of stuff and funnily enough a lot of the stuff I would write on piano mm -hmm. uh, I found it easy to sit down at an instrument that I was not too proficient at I find something that sounds good and then create stuff around it um, if I picked up a guitar and went to write it would only be a matter of 45 seconds before I'd start noodling <laughs> you know, and I'd go completely off track of yeah. the idea of writing the song. So, you know, I wrote tons of stuff. And when I was in Aussie, I actually played them three songs, mm -hmm. uh, two other songs. And, uh, uh, but it was, you know, Shot in the Dark that, that was the one that, that we wanted to work on. Um, the other two uh, were not. So. Yeah. What was it like to see Shot in the Dark um, get the response that it got to see the video? You made that must have been a huge moment for you in your career to not only be playing with Ozzy but have a song that you wrote, you know, be t be loved, be so loved by the audience. Uh, it all happened very fast, I think. Um, I mean, I had no idea that the song was going to be a single, mm -hmm. we were just looking for an extra song, uh, and that's how it was presented to us. So when we went and recorded the song. It wasn't until the album was done that uh, I think Sharon's uh, secretary called me and said, you know, they're talking about Shot in the Dark as being a single. And I went, they are? <laughs> okay, fair enough. And from that moment, it was a single. So we had to fly to New York, uh, we had to fly to LA to do a, a video. And we mm -hmm. did the video and then we flew back and then the video was done. And the next thing I do, I know I'm sitting there in Ozzy's front room and we're, you know, we just got the video tape because everything was on VCRs back then. <laughs> plugged it in and uh, we were watching the video and and I thought, wow, this looks great. And uh, I remember Amy was probably about two and she was like jumping up and down and dancing. And Ozzy looked around and goes, see if a two year old's jumping up and down, you know, it's gonna be a hit. I remember he said <laughs> that. I said, well, okay. Oh, that's really and then the song came out and, but it, it just happened very, very fast. It was almost like, you know, that, uh, being dragged by the scruff of the neck, like all these things yeah. happened very quickly and back to back. And I, the, the, the moment that stands out in my head was actually, I think it was in, uh, I think it was in Wichita, it was the first gig that we did in, on the Ultimate Sin tour. We'd just done a European tour, but it was this particular gig where here I was in a foreign country on a huge stage and there's a 20,000 seater or whatever, standing out there and we're playing this song and all these people are, are singing this song. And I thought, how do they know, how do they know the song? I mean, there's this, this is innocent, like, you know, realization that something like that spreads like wildfire and, uh, and gets around very, very quickly. And I just thought to myself, it, it was just a, you know, uh, a matter of a while ago that I was the only one who knew those lyrics. You know, so that was really the aha moment. I guess it's a hit. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, I imagine that, um, especially back then before social media or any or cell phones or anything like that, you're on trains, planes, automobiles, so you don't necessarily know 
what's going on in terms of like what's getting a lot of play on MTV or that unless somebody in your team tells you somebody like a manager or somebody calls you and says by the way this is blown up um so for you you just get out there and all of a sudden thousands of people are singing your song well yeah I mean it was a very different time as well compared to now I mean you know social media has um has removed all the distance between people there was a we I was reminiscing with a friend of mine who's older than me by the way <laughs> and we were saying you know how kind of it was kind of cool you go on tour you get on a bus and you're gone mm -hmm. there's no cell phones we barely had a we didn't have a tv on the bus I mean we had videotapes mm -hmm. but you were gone and the only way someone could get hold of you would be to leave a message at one of the hotels so you'd leave people with itineraries and say here's where I'm going to be if you need to leave a message when I get the message I'll call you back mm -hmm uh versus now where everyone's buried in their cell phones you know and it's like they're completely in connection with the with the outside world mm -hmm. um and i don't know i don't know that's really something that i i think is a good thing mm -hmm. I, I actually liked it being detached like that it made you feel that there was a sense of community mm -hmm. it made you feel that you were you know this band of traveling minstrels and that was your entire ecosystem and when you went when you went somewhere, it was like a new experience. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's just it's made the whole world so familiar. I mean, on another level, it's kind of you know. I always remember Peter Grant said said to me, you know, you have to you have to maintain some mystique mm -hmm. in what you do. It worked for Zeppelin. He didn't say it like that. He said, no, you have to maintain some mystique. You know, make sure. It's not. But it was uh, you had to do this and. Um, Led Zeppelin, for example, nobody really knew what they looked like. Nobody, there wasn't a, a, an abundance of photographs. There wasn't a, an abundance of appearances on TV. And so there was some mis mystery about the band. Who are they? And um, uh, I, 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 I'm writing a book at the moment. And so this is fresh in mind. But when I, when I heard that John Bonham had passed away and I didn't know if Jimmy Page was planning on putting another band together or if Zeppelin would continue or would go their separate ways or whatever. And I, I innocently wrote a letter, said, hey, Mr. Mr. Jimmy Page, I'm a huge fan, blah, blah, blah. If you ever put something together, you know, here's my name, please throw it in the hat and I'd love the opportunity to come down and, and, and play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know where to send it. So I took, look, took, took a Zeppelin album and turned it around on the bottom. There was an address and it said 484 Kings Road. Chelsea, and that was their management office. So I sent it there. Uh, and I did not expect to get an, an answer to that letter. And guess what happened? Um, <laughs> I did not get an answer to that letter. <laughs> today, today, if I sent an e a, a message on Facebook to some, some star and they didn't respond, I would be, I would be um, uh, appalled. I would be like insulted. I'd say that that's really not cool. You know, I, I, I would expect a response. I would expect a reply. And that's, I think, one of the differences that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, it's kind of a shame. It's quite funny, actually, because it, we go off on a tangent. When I did start playing with Jimmy, I went into this one room in Swan Song's office. And mm -hmm. the room was literally had a mound of unopened mail. <laughs> and I said to Sean, the girl who worked there, I said, what's, what's all this? We, Zeppelin gets tons of mail. I said, what do we do with it? She said, we put it in that room. <laughs> That's you what, your letter was probably in there. Nobody else. Oh, that's what I did. I, I sat there and I started rummaging through trying to find that letter because I didn't want it to be found. <laughs> and I couldn't find it. I, I never found it. Well, if it was filling a room, they probably weren't going to read them anyway. So even if right. it was I, there. I wonder what happened to them, you know? It's probably knows? still there. <laughs> probably, probably, probably still are. All right. So at some point you left Ozzy's band. Um, what made you decide to leave Ozzy and move on to Billy Idol, which I think was your very next uh, project? Well, um, there's a lot of chat about this kind of stuff that goes around. But ultimately, Ozzy's, Ozzy Osbourne's band was really only about one thing, and that was about Ozzy. Mm -hmm. And it was always about Ozzy. That's why it was Ozzy's band. And so it was very clearly represented to us that um, we were being hired to come in there and do the best possible work we could possibly do to make both Ozzy and the band sound as best as it possibly could and bring something um, constructive to, to the team. And uh, it was also 
um, unspoken but known that if any of us were unhappy with whatever arrangement we had, there were probably a lot of people sitting around, standing around the wings who would be glad to come in and do the same job. Mm -hmm. So as long as we wanted to be there, we were there. Mm -hmm. And as long as we were happy with what was going on, there was no question or no issue. Um, what happened in my case was I got to a point where uh, I was being asked to do a lot more writing, which I started doing. I wrote a lot of new songs and um, I had to cut a deal um, for my personal publishing with them. Uh, and I tried to work out a deal with Sharon and we went back and forth and, you know, it, it was a negotiation. And at a certain point in time, I realized that I wasn't going to get exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, and I had to realize that I was not in a position to make any other any other demands either. I mean, it it was it was what it was, and it was presented that way. It's like, look, this is what we can do, and if this is good for you, then it's good for us. And I had to think about it. And uh, I also had Billy at the time saying to me, you know, that he wanted to start a new band, mm -hmm. and all of these fa things factored in together. And then I thought to myself, well, maybe I've kind of done the, the whole full circle. I've done the tour, I've done this, I've done, if we do anything else, it's going to be repetitive. And I'm going to be unhappy with this aspect of the deal that I have. And so I made a very adult decision and said, you know, I'm going to move on. You know, there's been some rumors out there that, that I got fired or that I was kicked out or whatever, which is nonsense. I actually left the band um, and I left on those terms. Um, and um, you know, I think ultimately I was always looking for a band. Right. Ultimately, I, I couldn't help but feeling that I was, you know, I don't want to say hard gun because Ozzy's band was not a hard gun. We were much more than hard guns, but it was not a band. It was somewhere in between those two, those two markers. Um, and I loved the band, you know, obviously Randy was my closest friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved the time I spent with Ozzy as well. Ozzy was fantastic. And so, you know, it was a, it was a tough thing to, to, to leave. We just got Jake, uh, we just got Zach in the band and I was, he was, you know, he was, he was the other member in that uh, group of that fun group of people. And so I was sorry to leave that too, mm. you know, um, but I had to make a decision. And at the time it was a tough decision to make and some aspects of it did not work out exactly how I wanted it to, to work out. Um, but uh, I went on to do some great things. And something that I do remember was Randy, sadly, on his uh, deathbed, for want of a better word. I mean, he said to me, you know, he said, I, I got to tell you that I really admire what you did because you ended up doing all of these other things and you worked in all these different kind of diverse projects. And, you know, I really should have done something like that. Uh, and that made me sad. Um, at the time I left, he was very vocal about it. He was quite angry at me. You know, we were pals. And he said, I really don't want you to leave the band. And I said, well, I just, I, I just think I have to. I just think it's the right thing to do. Um, so we, you know, we had some arguments about it, but we stayed friends. We were very close. Um, so you moved on to the next thing you did was um, Billy Idol. He had put together another band. So it's interesting because you got to move on to a fresh new project and you got to, you know, um, I think you did your song right with him as well. With Billy I did Adam? write one song with him, yeah. Uh, for which Charmed I, Life? Huh? For the on Charm Charmed Life, yeah, Trouble with the Sweet Stuff. Uh, I turned it over to him. Uh, I, I don't know why I did that. Um, it, it, it did not, the, the situation did not end very well. Uh, end very well. There, was a, there was a lot of uh, distractions going on in that band. There were people, a lot of people involved that had nothing to do with music that had managed to sort of weasel their way into the, into the, into the group. And it was was causing a lot of uh, cloak and dagger nonsense to going on. The, the album was taking forever. We, we'd been working for almost a year and we had about five backing tracks mm -hmm. and it was just not working out as anybody had planned. And I started to get very frustrated for the same reasons that I described earlier. Right. You know, I, I'm like, I've got a, I got a career to, to get on with here. I've got a band I want to, you know, I want to, I want to work. And so, you know, it, it it didn't end that well, but I didn't I didn't end up playing on the record on mm -hmm. Charmed Life. 
So you moved from Ozzy, who is, again, you're not a hired gun, but you are a sort of a, I guess, backing band. Is that a, a fair thing to say where you're a proper band, but you're behind somebody who's, it's their name and their yeah, actually. Sure. And, then, band is fine. Yeah. Yeah. and then, um, and then Billy Idol, is, was it was a kind of the same thing. Was it like another backing band or did he present it differently originally? Uh, I think he presented it slightly differently at the beginning. He wanted to put a band together and, uh, you know, it, it's, that there's a part to going back in my childhood that I was a big, um, I was, wasn't even a, a fan. I mean, you couldn't have been unawares of what was happening where I lived in Maida Vale in Paddington in London in 1975, 1976, which was where punk music started. Mm -hmm. It started in that part of London at that time. Mm -hmm. And some of those bands, Chelsea, London SS, Kilburn and the High Roads, they turned into, you know, Generation X, they turned into, and I was, I got to be very friendly with a, a drummer by the name of John Tao, who was the original drummer in Generation X, and he thought I was really cool, he was trying to get me into some bands with him, but I was a little bit too young, and I feel like I missed that boat, and um, I always had this kind of, you know, love of that attitude music and I always wanted to sort of combine it with I was I was into rock I was into lots of different things but that was always a I always had a candle burning for that kind of music mm -hmm. and so um, what happened is that when Billy suggested this it took me right back to there and it was like ah yes I really want to do this nobody understood it everyone said why would you leave Ozzy you know, <laughs> and join up uh, basically a guy who was a you know a, a punk ba a based artist or whatever and that was the reason it was, it was some, some yayas that I still had from my childhood that was like, I always wanted to do this. So I jumped to the occasion. Yeah. So you it was know, like an opportunity to check that box that you might not otherwise yeah. be able to check. And, and Billy was kind of fed up with his guitar with Steve Stevens and he wanted to start something new. Uh, that's, a, you know, he told me, well, I want to do a new band and he wanted Randy to play drums. And, and uh, so we actually did get together all, all together and start doing some, some, right, some playing. We actually recorded some some material, which has since gotten lost. No one knows where those tapes are, but they were really cool. Mm. And uh, the band started to come together. And as as it sort of progressed, it started to go back much more to the Billy Idol thing with people, you know, playing with him. And then, like I said, there was some just some other stuff. I don't want to dwell on it too much. But the, all of a sudden, people started to come out the woodwork and. Um, you know, I'd go into the studio and I'd look around and go, who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it doesn't sound like the ideal band situation where you're in the no. studio with the band and maybe the producer. It sounds like there were just a lot of, just a lot of extraneous people there. So the, the next project you did was Beggar, or the next band you had was Beggars and Thieves. And what did that feel like for you? Because that must have been satisfying yeah. as a musician yeah. to, you know, to finally be like, have a band. Yeah. And it's kind of what I was looking for. And so you know, uh, as this was also starting to lose its, uh, for want of a better word, or pardon the pun, starting to lose its charm. I just said, you know, this is, uh, this isn't, this isn't it. I thought this was going to be it. This isn't, you know, uh, yeah, it's great playing with Billy. I love Billy. Billy's a hyper intelligent guy, super smart, really has the most charisma of anybody. I mean, he's amazing. And I have a lot of time for Billy, but I just, this, the situation wasn't, wasn't making me feel, um, you know, good, cathartic, mm -hmm. warm and fuzzy, or if you want to say that. Uh, and so, but I, I, you know, I'm glad I did work with him because I learned something. I learned a lot. I learned a different style of playing. Um, you know, musically, we, you know, we went from, you know, rock music which has an accent on the one and the three to effectively pop music or which which was on the two and the four and it was a slightly different approach to playing things and so I learned something and then I moved on and then you know Beggars and Thieves I was approached by Ron Mancuso and he was a guitar player and he said look we've got a possible deal with Atlantic and you'd be the missing piece for the puzzle if we can get you with your name and everything else we have a, a, a deal with Atlantic waiting for us. So I upped and moved to New York, joined Beggars and Thieves. We did an album on Atlantic that was released 
and uh, it uh, yeah, it was great. We went on the road. We toured. We played with uh, we did shows with with Tesla. We did shows with Dokken. We did shows with uh, you know we were managed by Q Prime. Peter mentioned Cliff Bernstein, who I'd known I'd known Peter and Cliff since early early days from London. And so I called them up and we were looking for a manager and I said, would you be interested in managing this band? And they said, yes. And so that's, that was Beggars and Thieves. It's a good record. Was, was this set like a good, satisfying feeling? Like, did you feel like you could exhale? Like I'm a part of a band. I'm kind yeah. of doing what I want, especially after being, you know, with two artists that are kind of known as almost solo artists, so to speak. Yeah, and this was, and this was a band that was really starting up from, from, from scratch. So, I mean, obviously they'd had their, their history, the, uh, Louis the singer and Ron the, the guitar player had had history for, before, but this was really a band that was starting from scratch. And so I was getting out the ground floor. And so that was great. That was really great. And it was worth, to me, it was worth uh, working with famous people or unfamous people, didn't matter. Established people, didn't matter. This was something from from grip from, from the start, so. Yeah. So somehow though, you ended up, you ended up in a band band, right? And then you ended up working for Vince Neil, which is another situation where you have kind of a person going by their name with a backing band again. Or like, yeah. So is it, was this just sort of a, like, I, I like these people, I wanna work with them. These are great opportunities from a musical standpoint, or was there something that you missed about being in that, that kind of scenario uh, when all was done and done? You know, Beggars and Thieves was 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 great, but we had a bad timing issue. We came out um, in probably 1989, 1990, 1990, around 89, 90. Mm -hmm. And um, right then was the sort of uh, the birth of uh, of of grunge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, um, the 80s was really drawing to a close. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that party was over. Did you and, feel it coming, Phil? Did you feel like, did you yeah. see it coming? Yeah, again, you know, I, I, was, I was writing about this in my book and I think I've written it uh, very, very well, how I put it, but all of a sudden it seemed that, um, uh, no, no disrespect to Janie Lane, who rest in peace, who I loved as a, a friend and as a, play, a band, I, I, I worked with his band as well, but, you know, we got to the whole cherry pie thing and it just seemed that the party was over. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, a, there was a certain point when I remember hearing uh, somebody played me uh, um, Feels Like Teen Spirit, it was Nirvana. And I thought to myself, ah, it's, you know, verse sounds like the police, so it's kind of chorusy guitar and then the big brashy. And, um, and then I realized that it was, um, uh, uh, it was probably the end of that era. I think it was the it was the end of that uh, the end of that time. So yeah, it was a um, there was a sense that that was going to be the end of it. I think the big the last hurrah was a huge huge Labor Day party that took place at the Mondrian, and uh, which is a big hotel in Los in Los Angeles, and I went there. It was, it was literally people crammed together person to person. It was the biggest party I've ever been to. And it was ridiculous. People were just shit faced, falling all over the place. And at the end of that party, I just, I remember thinking to myself, and I had a hotel room there because I had gone and, mm. and, and, and got a room there. And I remember going, leaving the hotel, looking at all this like big haired debauchery and people falling over each other. And I remember thinking to myself, I think this is the end of the eighties. It wow. was literally that moment. Who threw that party though? Do you think it was like, I have no idea. was it just a moment or was it like the labels just got together and went, let's just give them one last hurrah. They don't know it. No, 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 no. This was just, <laughs> was just, there's going to be a huge party at the Mondrian. It was one of those things. There's going to be a huge, there wasn't really, yeah. nobody threw the party. It was just like people started booking rooms over there. Okay. There was all kinds of illicit drugs taking place and stuff. You can use your imagination for that one. But it was just this ridiculous, debaucherous party. But I remember just seeing it in the light of day when I left the next morning and I went, this is done. This has really been played out. And unfortunately, I think that's the end of an era. And so that's what happened. <laughs> so you're, you're being able to see this moment. Um, it feels like it coincides really well with you working for somebody who is known as the French Elvis and moving to France and working for them. Was that, uh, was that kind of intentional? Like, 
this is kind of over for now and let me do something a little different for a little while or well, did that come up around in a different way? No, they came up with a different way. I mean, after Beggars and Thieves, I went to, you know, I, I got a call from Vince mm -hmm. and who I was very tight with and uh, had told me that he'd left Motley Crue and wanted to put a new band together. And so um, would I help? Actually, I got a call from him and his manager, Bruce Bird, and uh, they said, come down to the office and let's talk. And I went down, Jack Blades was there. Jack had written a song for Vince. And so we talked and we decided to put a band together. And so this was exciting as well. This is putting another band together. And this probably didn't depend as much on trends because Vince was already quite established through Motley. And uh, those songs that I would, had written for Ozzy um, that uh, when I left Ozzy, I took with me, uh, found their way onto Vince's album. So that's where Vince's songs came from. Hmm. And so we did that. And, you know, again, there's just another example of something that just doesn't work out the way you think it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. And some hurdles and hiccups and things didn't, didn't work out well. And I, I decided to take some time off. I took a little bit of time off. And then, and then after that, I got back into it with Johnny. Cool. So you went to, you went to France and you guys played, I think um, from what I understand about his career is he's very like European centric, right? Like he, he's known like really, really well known. There are some, yeah. sells tons and tons of albums. Very yeah, well. Fourth, fourth biggest selling life. artist in the history of music for the entire world. Would you believe that? Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of incredible, but he's the only people who sold more records than him were uh, the Beatles, Elvis, and the number one guy who will never guess who it is. Do you have any idea? Is it a country guy or something crazy like that? Nope. Yeah. No, I don't know. It's the most common language in the world outside of English. Oh my God, you're testing me. I don't, I'm going to guess Chinese because there's a lot of people. In oh, China. no, that's a really good point. But <laughs> within, within the Western world, it's Spanish. Oh, Spanish, yeah. Julio yeah. Iglesias. <laughs> oh, I'm actually not surprised by that. I mean, I guess I'm surprised that he still holds that number. But I think in the 80s, I would have believed that pretty easily because yeah. he was he was really well loved everywhere. But is yeah. he still is he still in the top four? Is he still know. number one? I wow. Know. I really don't. I knew back then. But <laughs> back then, so, yeah. Uh, I guess I'm not overly shocked, but yeah. yeah. I, I, I got I got called in on a session um to to play with um, uh, to play on his album. Um and uh, it was being recorded in LA. Chris Kimsey, who produced uh the Stones. Um, he was a good friend and I'd known him back from Swan Song days and uh, we'd stayed in touch and he called me and asked me to come in and play on a couple of tracks that he was doing for this French singer and I went down there and I remember walking <laughs> and I walked into the studio and I looked around and it was it was all of Little Feet it was Richie Hayward and it was everyone except for Kenny Gradney which I was a huge Little Feet fan and talk about being intimidated. I mean, these are the guys who I looked up to since I was a kid, kind of like Steely Dan, you know? And um, um, and uh, Chuck Lavelle, who plays keyboards with the Stones, was playing organ in the corner. And, and uh, I was like, okay, well, this is one of those make or break moments. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna pick up the guitar and I'm either gonna play and it's gonna be great. And they're probably gonna say, thanks a lot. That was really good or it's just gonna be terrible and I'll never work in this town again. <laughs> so it turned out to be the former and we had a great time and uh, they asked me to play on some more stuff. And eventually a few months later, I get a phone call from Johnny in France saying, I'm gonna go on the road and you know, would you like to play my band? For anybody who doesn't know his music, cause I'm, I'm honestly not very familiar. What style is it? Are we talking rock music? Is it like metal? What, what does he play? Yeah. What Johnny was before? Johnny's referred to as the French Elvis because mm -hmm. he was around in the fifties and during every decade he'd had you know tons and tons of hits. But his his style of music changed just as I suppose uh, you know the Stones would have changed or any other Clapton would have changed or or anyone else. So he went through periods and they also had this thing in France where they would cover big hits and have them translated into French. And then he, he would have huge hits with songs that had been very, very well known as well. So uh, he was an institution, mm. there's no doubt about it. Um, when I started working with him, uh, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. Forget Ozzy. I mean, this was, just as if, if this guy said, I'm going to do a concert in the middle of the town, um, 
uh, the government would stop everything, would shut all the roads, they would open it up, there'd be a million people there. Uh, I mean, this is an institution. This is like wow. nothing I've ever seen. That's and it just was, it blew me away. There's a great story actually we went on, the, on one of the tours. We, I did four albums and four tours with them, I think five tours maybe. One of the tours we played in Paris and we played at the uh, place called the uh, Bercy, which is the Palais de Sport. It's uh, about a 20,000 seater. And a certain friend of mine was in town and said, oh, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's come and see you play. When are you playing? And I said, well, you know, yesterday, tonight, tomorrow, whenever you want to come. <laughs> said, well, how many nights are you playing there? I said, we're playing 20. We're playing 20 nights back to back and it was sold out. Wow. 20,000 people a night, 400,000 people. Incredible. Insane. It was totally insane. Yeah. Did you miss those days? Yeah. Yeah, I had a great time. Listen, so I missed just about Every, I, I have great memories of every single thing that I've ever done. And it's a, it's a really, it's really wonderful to carry that around. And I just feel regret that certain people are not able to experience that on a, on a personal level. Um, it's really enviable to have those kind of memories and to have those kind of experiences. And that's really why we do this stuff. I mean, you know, I, I, I sometimes I shock myself when I think, when I look back in retrospect and look at all of these opportunities that I was privileged and honored to be able to experience. Mm. Uh, and it's just, it's mind boggling. But uh, being living in France uh, and certainly, you know, with Johnny Halliday, where everywhere we went, we were celebrities. Mm. I mean, people would literally, you know, fall over and, hey, have a case of Petrus, you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, it was it was remarkable. We traveled. We had a great time. I love Johnny. Rest rest his soul. He was just a most wonderful person. Mm. When he passed away, I was extremely sad. Mm. It's a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> some of the Robin Lemazurier who played guitar with him up until the end, good friend of mine. Um, he played at his uh, funeral at the at the church, and there was four presidents, French presidents, ex presidents sitting there. There was a million people on the streets. There were dignitaries from all around the world. Wow. And I just sat at home and watched it on video and sort of oh, on TV and sort of mourned in my own way, went through, looked through all pictures and mm -hmm. videos. What a lovely guy he was. I mean, he really was, he was, he was the, the best and he was the real deal. Oh, well, I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm, I am glad you had that opportunity to connect with him and play with him on so many albums and uh, so many shows. Yeah, he was, uh, he really knew, he, he, he knew how to be a star. I mean, that guy was a star through and through. But it was a great, a great thing. One day we came out of a show and he'd, he'd got some money from the uh, management for whatever reason. I think the number 15,000 euros comes to mind or francs or whatever it was back then. And we went into this casino where we were staying and he walked up to the table and people were falling about themselves. Oh my gosh, it's Johnny Halliday. And he's put 15,000 on black on the roulette table. And uh, some people had their money on red. And he said, no, put it on black. And they're like, oh, okay. So they put it on black. And they threw the ball in there, it went flying around, bounced. And I swear it landed in red. I swear it was in red. And then something sort of happened and it jumped out and it went into black. And he doubled his money. He took his money. Everyone won. He took, her, took his money, walked away. So that, and he looked around and he goes, that's how you gamble. I said, tell me something. I said, what would you have done? if it had fallen in red and you'd lost the money. He said, well, regardless, all those people around that table would have had a story to tell the rest of their lives. And that's, <laughs> that's all that's important. And I thought, well, so how brilliant. <laughs> that's really what it's about. <laughs> it must be nice to be Johnny Halliday, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, you, um, after, after that, uh, I don't want to rush through the rest of your career because you've done so many amazing things, but I want to make sure that we get to your solo stuff that you're working on. Um, or that you've been putting out and that you have some singles out right now. I also want to make sure we talk about Last in Line. Yeah. Um, so after after French Elvis, if, if you could share some of the things that you've done before you before you started making solo albums in Last in Line. Yeah, I'd just like to tell you one thing about French Elvis as well, which was at a young age, something that really affected me was American 50s, Americana, rock and roll music. I became a huge Elvis fan. I became a huge fan of, of Bill Black and Scotty Moore, his 
those early bands and rockabilly stuff. So there was that thing when I got to play with 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 Johnny, we would do a part of our show was his fifties kind of hits and stuff. Oh, nice. So that was again another checkbox. Another of things check, a really big checkbox, I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was fantastic. After that, I worked with um, I worked with Steve Lukather. In fact, I came back right after, uh, after we, we got done with Johnny, I started working on an album with Steve and we did the Luke album, which is, I think his third solo record. And uh, I wrote half that record. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the, my favorite songs that I've ever written are on that record. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of the great, greatest times I've ever had were in that band with uh, the, that group of uh, Greg Bissonette, Steve, myself, and Brett Tuggle, and we traveled around the world and uh, played our music. That was really, really a great time. Yeah. It was fantastic. I had a lot of successes with Steve. We wrote a lot of stuff together. Um, we had a really great writing chemistry. Um, I wrote a song for Toto uh, called After You're Gone on the Minefields album, and I understand that was nominated for a Grammy, so that was pretty cool. It's amazing. As close as I got to that. Um, apart from working on the Grammys, and I worked on the board of the Grammys, I was vice president of the Grammys in Los Angeles for two years. I was on the board for eight years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was more administrative and you know, doing things for Music Cares and, you know, just rushing through all this right now. But, um, and then after working with Steve, um, uh, then I worked with John Waite. I played with John for a good three or four years. Um, we had a guitar player in, um, in Johnny Halliday's band, Shane Fontaine. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Shane, but he played with Springsteen, he played with Sting. He plays now with uh, uh, with uh, Graham Nash. And he also plays sometimes with CSN. Mm -hmm. But he called me up and he said, hey, I'm working with John. Do you wanna, do you wanna come do some shows? And I, I love John. So yeah, big, big fan of John White. Mm -hmm. Great singer, great, great singer, great writer. I mean, amazing. I didn't write with John, but we, I played with him, but it was like front row seats at your favorite concert every night, you know? I had a lot of fun with him. Was, we're still good friends. Um, and then after that, uh, uh, my friend Richie Cotson asked me to put a, you know, if we wanted to put a band together, we put together a band that turned out to be a solo band, which was way back in the beginning, um, probably about 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, mm -hmm. around then. And we did three world tours, together um started doing some solo material of my own mm -hmm. out a couple of albums yes you did <laughs> it brings me to the current point brings you to right. the current point so you have two albums um, um under solo name and uh, under your own name and yeah. then more recently in the last it feels like in the last six months you put out two singles um i think one was in november and one was in february just a, a month and a half ago yeah. um tell me about the process was was were those two singles were those made during this year while we've been socially distancing or were yeah. the things you made beforehand you know i was i i tried to do as much as possible to keep everything moving along and, and last in line you know i've been a, a i've been quite motivational with the band i mean i'm trying to make things keep things happening we wanted to work on a few different aspects and you know i'd find things that we could do but in the meantime i wanted to sort of also you know write another so third solo record mm -hmm. so um we have some you know considerations with last in line we you know i was trying to plan a, a streaming show mm -hmm. we're not able to do it because Vivian has some pre-existing health um, issues and that he's not really able to, to travel until we have some, you know, assurance that he's going to be healthy right. and, and able to do so. So out of respect, we, we tried to do some other things and, you know, we tried that we had a TV show, which, um, uh, which was like a, a zoom chat show that we would do occasionally. And that was fun. And we also had to, uh, you know, go about getting a new record deal. So we were changing labels. So that's something we're in the process of doing and we're getting pretty close now. Um, but part of that was writing a third record. So we've been hard at work trying to write a third record and even record that third record while we've been in different locations around the, 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 the world. And obviously this, this band works as a unit mm -hmm. in every sense of the word. So it's a real handicap not being able to be in the same room as everybody and trying to make it happen. So in the meantime, I was 
going to write another solo record. And again, I was having a conversation with Richie and I said, yeah, I'm going to put, a, you know, I've got all these songs. I want to finish and put them together. And he said to me, you know, I'm sort of releasing things song by song. Why don't you do that? And I said, well, I hadn't really thought about it. And then I thought, yeah, well, why not? So I had this one song, which uh, I started putting um, together. Um, I had the, this, uh, this lyric, please don't make me wait. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, what am I going to write this about? What can I write this about? <laughs> while I was sitting there, I was going, you know what? I know exactly what to write this about. I'm stuck <laughs> here. You know, I want to be playing shows. Don't make me wait any longer. Mm -hmm. And the and immediately the lyrics came together like that. Uh, I did a makeshift video for it, put it out there, and everybody loved the song. They felt it was very topical. It's very, it's very relatable for literally everybody on earth because we're all going through this together. But I really loved the video because you really invited your fans to be a part of it. Tell me, tell me about the video. Yeah, I, I, I put a word out there and said, listen, I'd like uh, everybody to go and uh, find, uh, uh, they'll go to their local venue in a state of being shut down and take a picture and send me the picture because it's gonna be incorporated into a video. Mm -hmm. And so I used those, those videos so as to incorporate, you know, our fans. You know, our, touring is, is not just about us, it's about our fans. And without our fans, we don't have anything. Mm -hmm. We're part of the same, we're part of the same group, you know, our, our, the bands and the fans. I mean, if, without one, there is, there is no other. And so this clampdown has affected us. It's affected them. It's affected the people who work at the venues. It's affected everybody. And this was really an anthem for everyone to, to identify with. So that's why I put it out. And, you know, and then I followed it out with another song, which, which is a, a song I love um, that I'd had for a while. And I wanted to, Get it just right. I must have recorded it five times and mixed it fifteen times, but I think I got it right at the end. Go fly yeah, again. Fly again. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm got another song I'm working on right now. Right Very nice. So is that going to be the third single? Single, the one that you're. Yeah. Working on? Yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm sort of brimming with ideas on how I want to do this because obviously in the past we've released an album, yes. you know, and I package it and it looks really great. And um, but now it's like I'm. I'm sort of releasing these as just singles, and I'm. I'm having some. I'm, I'm sort of brainstorming a little bit, trying to think of a, a unique, a unique way of releasing this collection of songs in some kind of, some kind of album. I'm even thinking about releasing it as a, as an NFT, you know? So are you, are you feeling good about it right now? Like as they're coming out one by one, does this feel like something you want to stick to for this round of songs? Yeah, I love it because he, you know, I, I spend much more, I spend a lot of time on each song. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the time I'm having to work on, on the, my, uh, on my own. Mm -hmm having to do uh, play all the instruments and everything else uh so that takes time mm. you know um and it's much harder to work on things when you're the only person playing everything because you can't change things and see how things work you have to record them and play them back to see how they're going to so I want to actually know, we've talked so much about songwriting. That's such an important part of your career and what you do as a musician. What is your process? Are, so for example, I know that some songwriters, they decide that they're going to dedicate a certain number of minutes or hours per day. And then there's other people who maybe wait for inspiration and then write when they have an idea. Do you fall into either of those camps or do you do something differently? There's a very famous story about Paul Simon that he would say that he would sit down every morning at uh, uh, nine o'clock in the morning with a cup of coffee and a pen and uh, paper to write a song. It didn't mean that he was going to write a song every morning, but if he was going to, he would be prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if he didn't, if nothing came up, he'd write a diary entry. Um, I love that story. And I'd love to be that regimented that I could be that disciplined <laughs> to, to do it. No, it's not like that. With me, um, uh, it, it, there's no real pattern to it, like which comes first, the music or the lyrics? Yes. Sometimes the music, sometimes the lyrics. Sometimes it stems from an, an idea. You get inspired by something. Most of the time, it's, um, it's something musical with me that I'm playing on acoustic guitar, mm -hmm. and then I'll record it on, on this. And then I'll have tons and tons of these recordings, and then I'll forget, I'll leave it. Mm -hmm. Then I'll go back and I'll listen through and I'll find three or four things that I really like. And those go to, to a, sh a, a short list. And from there, I will start messing around with them. And I'll be looking for 
some music and I'll be looking for melodies as well. And I'm looking for melodies and music that go together until I've created something. And once I've created something, then the process really, really go, moves along. It's very rare that I sit down there and write a song from start to finish in 20 minutes. I've done that before. I did mm -hmm. that with a song called Tears of My Own Shame that I wrote for Lukather. Literally wrote it in 20 minutes from start to finish. Uh, and that, that happens very, very seldom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wish it happened more often because it's, it's incredibly cathartic, but you know, more, of the, more often the than, than not, you, you know, it, takes, it takes time to write these songs. You know, some some people I know takes uh, they take months to write songs. Um, so that's the process, and you know, you've always got all these. It, it's really an organizational process because you've got so many ideas that, that that are in at point A. You've got less ideas at point B, less at point C, and at point D, you've got three or four that you happen to be working on that moment in time. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have to have the lyrical content. You have to have you have to be inspired by something. Um, being inspired about to write a song is about having an emotion, having a feeling about something. Anger, happiness, sadness, something that's, 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 that's emoting some kind of feeling in you. And it's taking that and it's putting it in the form of a medium, which is a music medium. And then there's a skill, which is to go through that song and extract every single personal bit of information out of it. You want to take all of that stuff and fish it out because you don't want your song to be about you. I don't want to write a song that says, oh, you know, I was in love with this girl and then she dumped me and left me for some reason, it's broke my heart. Oh, that's too bad. Not interesting to anybody, who cares? But if you turn it around and you say, have you ever been in love with somebody who dumped you, who broke you? All of a sudden it becomes about somebody else. And if it becomes about somebody else, that opens the opportunity for people to relate, to insert themselves into it. And then they can say, hey, you know, that song speaks to me. That makes me feel, uh, uh, I had a similar experience that emotes something. And now I feel that feeling that the writer must have had when he wrote the song. And that's really the whole purpose of songs, of, of art. You take an emotion, you put it into a medium, somebody else hears that medium, medium and it emotes the same feeling you had when you wrote it. It's a transference of emotion. It's a transference of feelings, transference of communication, of energy, of, 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 of sadness, of happiness, of whatever it is. That's, I, that's to me, you know, what songwriting is all about. And I'm very serious about it, you know, because I think I'm very critical about it is, is a better word, because if it's, it's not doing that, if I don't get that aha moment, then I'm still working on it. There's something missing. And how does that process change for you when you're working with a band? So for example, if you would go in with Last in Line and you're all in the studio together, how does your writing change? It's completely, it's a completely different way of working. And it's a much more granular and organic and uh, and and great way of working because it's it's a rare, it's a rare opportunity where you can have four guys go into a room, literally with no ideas, with nothing, with no preparation and say, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick up our instruments. We're gonna bang something out. And as soon as we have something here where we say, oh, that's pretty cool. Then we'll try to come up with the next part. It's what I do on my own. Mm -hmm. That's how I do things on my own, but we're doing it collectively as a group. And there's very few people who are able to do that as a group. I mean, this band is, is remarkable. It's incredible. Um, Vinny, Vivian, Andrew, and, and myself, these guys are fantastic. And we literally do work as a unit. I've never really been able to do that with anyone. So there's a, an incredible, incredible amount of, uh, of, uh, of, of good feeling about this mm -hmm. and, and, and trust. And when we do come up with stuff, it's, um, you know, we're very proud of it. And needless to say, I mean, I don't know if you've spent much time around this. Everything with us is about humor. I mean, we just take the piss out of each other. We laugh at everything. You know, even bad things, we find something to laugh about. And, uh, and, and I think that comes across in, in the music, you know? Yeah. The interesting thing about Last in Line is you guys started, and this is a little bit before your time, before you joined the band, but it started as a band that was playing Dio songs, right, yeah. that, they, that they had played on, and then it's the band started writing original music, and now you're kind of doing both. Do you see Last in Line eventually 
getting to the point where you only play your original music yeah. and you're not doing the Dio stuff anymore? Yeah, totally. You know, this, the whole thing started, as you correctly say, with the original Dio band. And the idea was, at first when I joined the band, was to finish out some obligations for some concerts. And um, during that time, my goal in the band was no, nothing more than to channel Jimmy Bain. I mean, Jimmy, and, Jimmy was a friend. And um, I felt bad that he'd worked really hard on this record and been unable to play it for anybody. And this is a way for me to give back and do something for my friend. So my, my goal was to channel Jimmy, uh, both on the original Dio songs that we would do and on the unique, uh, the, on the original songs on the, uh, the, the Heavy Crown album. And so, uh, you know, I was just trying to say, well, what would Jimmy do? And I was just playing like Jimmy. I knew, I know, I knew Jimmy really well. I knew how he played. Uh, and gradually, as time went on, it became aware to us that we had a, um, that this band had legs, and that there was an opportunity to kind of, you know, continue that process, that writing process. And it, over the next year or two, it became evident that this band really had its own spirit and was going to move. And with all credit to Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And to Ronnie, of course, but the, the you know it started with that DNA, and it was moving along in a in a unique fashion, and we decided to keep it going. So, um, I think that culminated at the um, Download Festival that we played a, a year and a half or two years ago, where we had an opportunity to play at this you know Download, which was used to be called Donington. It's huge. I played there with Ozzy. You know, it was 1986, hundred thousand people. And we said, hmm, we're backstage and we're trying to put the set list together. And we had this idea, I said, well, what if we just play all our original material? We don't play any DL stuff. I mean, it's a bit of a gamble, but what do you think? <laughs> and we said, you know, let's do it. I mean, listen, you might as well, you know, you might as well try it. You might as well try it because it'll be go home. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it'll answer every question right there and then, and then we'll know what to do next. Um, and we did that. And everybody loved it. So it was fantastic. So we played all our original material. So I think that was a, that was a turnaround moment for us. That was, you know, every time we find ourselves on a festival, we're here with 18 bands that are all going, it's all this stuff that's going on. We're playing classic rock and it's, which is a very, maybe it's not a very currently fashionable type of rock to be playing. But it's such a breath of fresh air to everybody. Everyone's like, oh my God, I loved your set. Your set was awesome. So powerful. It was so cool. It was so, so we've got something here. You can do everything right in this business. And it can sometimes it just doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. So when you do something and it works out, hang on to it. <laughs> you know, you must be doing something right. <laughs> well, then we we will have a third album to look forward to at some point where everything gets settled and you guys have a chance to to get in the studio together and write. Um, we have singles coming out from you um, for your from your solo career, and there there was also something I read about a Vegas show, Long Live Rock. Is that still is that yeah, still? We're work, sure, we're trying to work on that. You know, we're, some of us were were part of a, a show um, in Vegas before. Uh, and um, the show finished and we wanted to make sure that we had something else you know now that I live in Vegas there's so many musicians here and I, I'm, I'm one of these people loves putting things together mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. between Andrew myself and Paul Shortino we we started talking and said you know let's let, let's do something let's make something that's permanent I don't know how we're going to do it or how we're going to produce it or where it's going to be mm -hmm. but we have a show and we have the participants of that show and we can make it happen and all we need is the, the exact, the right location. So as soon as things open up here, we're looking forward to having a, a show together. And it's really, the, the, the show would be lots, it'll be a kind of a revolving door of, of, mm -hmm. of name artists who would come in and we'd play one or two of those songs from that person's repertoire, but in, combine it into a group of standard hits over the last 20 years that people know and love. Um, and it's just, uh, it could be a Vegas show, It'd be entertaining. We'll have a slideshow behind it uh, <laughs> and just a really, really well played professional gig. I think it'd be a great thing for people to come to Vegas. They want to come out and see classic rock songs and 
see great people. I mean, we have some great people in the band. Very you know, nice. We have great people coming in and out. You know, David Mata will come in from Mario Speedwagon. And, you know, I, I actually, uh, um, I just talked to Joe Vitale this morning from, from, the, um, from Joe Walsh's band, and he would love to come in and do, do some play. I mean, all these people would love to come in. And we know all these people. It's like, how great to get, bring these people together just for a fun show, you know? That's okay. And it sounds like it'll change for you guys too. So you're not literally playing the same songs every night all year. It'll change depending on who's in the band with you at the time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. sure. I mean, we, like I said, we worked, all, we always worked together on this previous show. So, you know, Jay Shellen uh, was, was the drummer on the show before and he went off to, he's now part of Yes, but mm -hmm. he would come back and play. Blas Elias plays drums normally with us. So mm -hmm. you know, that's great people. Yeah. Very good. Something to look forward to. Yeah, definitely. And then you've talked about your auto, but I assume it's an autobiography. I hope it's an autobiography. Is that the book that you're working on right now? Yeah. Is the book about your career and your life? Yeah. yeah How's yeah. that coming yeah. along? Good. It's, it's, it, I finished it a while ago, but um, I'm in the process of reading and rereading and rereading. And rereading. I suppose <laughs> it's like one of those things where eventually you have to drop it and say, okay, that's enough. Right, that's right. Enough. But obviously I wanted to, I wanted to come across well. It's a it's a funny story. I mm -hmm. mean, it's definitely I've tried to make it a lot about what it was like growing up at certain times and certain places. And again, not too much about just I did, I did, I did. That's not interesting to anybody. So um, mm -hmm. there's that part of it. I think it's it's cool. Um, and I've tried to keep a, a funny side to it. And I've tried to tell as many tales as I can. You got to be careful because you know this is my story. It's not someone else's story, and I don't want to tell someone else's stories um but uh it's definitely entertaining and um i i i i'm i'm still wrestling with uh you know how i'm going to put it out but uh you know i'm i'm excited about my book i really am it's uh it's going to be cool when it comes out so are you making decisions about whether it'll be self-published or yeah. whether it'll go through a publisher and, and exactly. how it will be promoted okay yeah that's really what i'm wrestling with at the moment you know, I've, so many people have said to me on one side, hey, you know what, self-publish it. And so mm -hmm. many people said, no, 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 publish it, you know, go through a publisher. And I really don't know. I'm still deciding. I think if I, <laughs> I'm leaning towards self-publishing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, I, well, I would imagine there's the benefits and drawbacks to both, just like making an album, you know, yeah, being signed I, versus pushing it out yourself. And I, and I don't really know enough about it. I mean, I wish I knew more about it, but mm -hmm. it's not my area of expertise. And so it's, you know, fishing around trying to find out as much as I possibly can. Well, you'll be an expert soon enough. As soon as that book comes out, you're going to you're going to learn very quickly. <laughs> I, you know, I thought I, after this, I'll write another book. And, but writing one one autobiography is enough. I mean, it's yeah. it took years, it took like three or four years. Yeah. And it's well, um, raining. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I mean, I think we all love a good rock star autobiography. I'm looking forward to reading yours, uh, especially given how positive your outlook is that regardless of how anything ended, there's beautiful things to be taken and great memories that come from everything. So I'm, I'm imagining that there's a bit of that tone in your book as well. Yeah, there, there is. There's, there's, if, if, if I was to say one thing about the book in general is it's, 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 it's the definition of success. Yeah, some people think that success is something that you've got to, to, to this point. This, this is success right here. And if I can get to this point, this is success. Mm -hmm. And the point of my book is that success is not a point in time or a point in your career. It's very much a retrospective thing. It's something where you stop for a moment and you look back and you see all of the stuff that you've done and you think, my God, you know, um, I'm quite happy with all these things that I've done. Mm -hmm. And that would be the definition of success. It's not that you have money or that you have cars or that you have this or, your, or that you've attained this certain level of fame. It's that you've done things that you feel good about and that you look back and say, you know, I wouldn't change any of those things. Mm -hmm. And even the bad experiences, well, somehow I can say that I learned something good from those experiences. So I, I, that's what I believe the, the message of the book is. And that applies to everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. You know, you, you should make an exercise of stopping from time to time, looking back and saying, do I, you know, are these 
Um, am I happy about these things? Are these things good? Because if not, there's still plenty of time to make a change. Mm -hmm. Always. You've offered some advice already, but is there is there any bit of advice that you would want to share with your fellow musicians, maybe particularly somebody who's starting their musical journey um, and really wants to be a musician and make this their life? Uh, well, like I said before, be absolutely sure that this is what you want to do and that you'll do it, you know, come hell or high water. I mean, it's really what you want and it's the only thing that for me, it's like when I don't, when I have finished with a long day and I've done all kinds of other stuff, I'll sometimes sit down. I'm not a television guy. I just, I just don't watch television. I can't, can't stand it. It's, it's just a time sponge. You know, it's just awfully, I, I just don't, I don't relate to it that way. I mean, if I want to watch a movie, I'll watch a specific movie. I'll put it on and watch it and that'll be an experience. But at the end of that day, I'll pick up an acoustic guitar and I'll sit there and I'll play until I want to go to bed. That's the, that's the thing that I'll do at the end of every day. And so that speaks volumes about what I'm attracted to. And so, you know, if it was, if you feel that way, then that might be, you know, the sort of thing you should do. If you feel that at the end of the day, you want to paint, then maybe being a painter would be good or write or anything else. Um, there's something, there are some things that we are passionate about and you have to be very passionate about this because when in this business that presents you nothing but hurdles, that's the only thing that's going to get you through them is the passion. So that's important and don't waste your time on things. You know, if things don't work out, don't be afraid to make a left turn. Randy Castillo used to say that, so I'm paraphrasing Randy, mm -hmm. hey, you know, make a left turn and don't look back. Mm -hmm. He used to say that all the time. And as I've got older, I've realized the wisdom in those words, because um, it could be anything. It could be bad relationships. It could be bad situations. It could be bad bands. It could be bad anything. You know, the, the, the one thing, is, thing I regret is, you know, trying to make something work, trying to make something work that is not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work because it, I have no power over it, because it's not in my you know, con control. It might have a lot to do with somebody else or other people. And in those situations, you can try to make things work, but if it doesn't work, don't be afraid to, you know, move on. Move on, leave it behind. You know, that's, I think that's another very important bit of advice because that there's nothing that feels more um, of a shame than, 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 than lost time. In time, you think, ah, I should have spent that time doing something, doing what I'm doing now, doing what, it, you know? Well, thank you so much. It has been a great honor to meet you and talk to you and learn more about you. And I'm really excited for your next single. I'm excited to, for the next Last in Line album. And we'll definitely be adding your Vegas show to my list of things to do when we're finally allowed to get on a plane and go somewhere and just really let her hair down and enjoy some good music. Thank you so much, Sarah. And you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to putting the songs out and, you know, I, I, I've gotten this idea that I have to put a video with each song now. I mean, what do you think? Do you think the videos are a great idea? Or... You know what, I am I like a video, um, but I'm also old school. So I, I came up, I'm part of that MTV crowd, but I, I like the idea of a video. And I think a lot of bands are doing lyric videos, you know, so I think when, the, when there isn't, you know, the opportunity to do a full, you know, video, I think a lyric video totally works. Well, originally, Please Don't Make Me Wait was going to be just a lyric video. And then somebody said to me, hey, don't, you know, don't discount the idea of putting yourself in your lyric video because mm -hmm. people will identify. So that's how that video was, was born. And I put that together myself and as I did with Fly Again. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to, that's, that's the second part of the process. I have to write the song, then I have to come up with the cool video. So, you know, but uh, hey, why not? <laughs> well, thank you again for being a guest on my show. And you should definitely come back when albums come out, when singles come out, and definitely when that autobiography comes out. Definitely, Sarah. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate your uh, your questions and the the, uh, the the conversational nature of, of, of this interview and talking in so much detail about some of these wonderful experiences. So thank you so much for this. Thank you.